Well, let's take a look at another aspect of electrochemistry and photo, photo processes, and that's, we'll stop talking about semiconductors. Um, semiconductors were thought to be the salvation, uh, especially in the 80s when there was some sort of energy crises, 70s and 80s. Energy got to be very expensive and they thought, well, let's make, let's use photo methods to generate uh, reagents. For example, using photoelectrosynthesis to make fuels or to make hydrogen or oxygen for fuels. And that was a big topic of research. Now that energy is very cheap, gas is as cheap as it's ever been in the U.S. basically, uh, it's not so uh, economically viable to use photoelectrochemistry to do anything like that. And there's really no other system that people are actively pursuing, I don't think, to use directly photoelectrochemistry. But I think that will change. And once people get some better semiconductor systems that don't corrode, that are more stable, they will eventually find a use for photosynthesis and uh, photocat photocatalysis. But let's take another look at some other implications of light and electrochemistry, and that's electrochemiluminescence. Probably have Imad come up here and give this uh, seminar. He <laughs> gave a seminar last year on this, so he probably knows more about it than I do. Now, ECL is a, is a, is a method of generating light using a chemiluminescence reaction, and the electro part of it usually refers to the fact that you're using the electrode to generate reagents that will then generate light. And the electrodes that you're generating, the reagents that you're generating are usually unstable so that we can generate them in the vicinity of the electrode. They can react to produce light and then give off the light. So rather than mixing two reagents together, you're generating them in situ at the electrode. Of course, you can make light with an electrode a lot of ways. You could put a very high voltage across and get a spark and things like that. We're not talking about that sort of thing. We're talking about low voltage of, it, of things that are occurring due to oxidation reduction of species in solution. Okay, now if the, redox, the reason we can do that is that we can think about redox reactions having a large excess of energy available. And so the energy that we get when we oxidize or reduce two species by mixing them together may be enough so that the, the potential energy difference is enough to produce a photon of visible light. So if we have a large delta E zero of two compounds, we may have enough energy in the oxidation reduction process to produce uh, HV, a light. And that comes about because we're producing an excited state. Now a prototype reaction is the reaction of diphenylanthracene typically done in non-aqueous solvents, and we'll abbreviate it diphenylanthracine DPA. And what you can do in electrodes is make the radical anion and the radical cation. And if you mix them together in a pseudonitrile, what can happen is that you'll get the production of a singlet state DPA, excited state molecule, and DPA. And this reaction to form the singlet state excited DPA requires about three EV of energy. And there's enough energy, the voltage difference between the, the radical anion and the radical cation is greater than three volts. And so there is enough energy just by mixing them together to form a, elect a molecule in that excited state. That a triplet excited state then can decay by a number of routes, one of which is a photo emission route to emit some light at about 3 eV. That is not always the best, uh, not always the route that might happen. Another possible reaction is uh, just having two DPAs being formed in the ground state. And that's what normally happens when we have redux, oxidation reduction processes in solution. We just have those react. They tend to form a lot of heat in that case, and uh, we don't see any, any results. That's about a 3.2 EV system.
All right. We're going to get a def different possibility. Suppose we react diphenylanthracene radical anion with uh, a molecule TMPD radical cation. TMPD is a diamine tetramethyl diaminophenol, or however I don't know, or biphenyl. A tetramethylphenylene diamine, I guess is what they call. And when we react that, what you get is a triplet diphenylanthracene excited state, which uh, is produced with only uh, two EV. And that's not enough to get, uh, to get, get the light output. What can happen, though, is that we have the triplet DPA reacting with another triplet DPA to produce a singlet DPA. And a ground state DPA. So this is called a triplet triplet annihilation reaction. the uh, triplet is not sufficient to really produce any light. We can either have those triplet then decay with a slow process that from a triplet to the ground state again, it's a forbidden process, or we can have those triplets react in solution. Because they're there in solution, they can react to produce a singlet state and a ground state DPA, which then reacts. Now, the light you get out would be the same. You'd get the same frequency of light, the excited state DPA exciting back to the ground state. Uh, of course, the kinetics of the system would be different. Here we've got a, a, um, a system that is uh, second order in the DPA, the light production. Here we have, we, by changing the um, concentrations of the species, we're going to see a difference in the uh, kinetics. The triplet species has to react with itself to do the reaction. are organic species. Um, typically in organic species, in order to get this, we need rigid systems that can't, don't have a lot of uh, ways to, to give up their energy by, say, vibrational modes and so on. And so they're forced to give up their energy in a, in a photon. Other ways to do this is uh, non-organic species or inorganic species. A very popular material is rubipi. Remember the BP? Y is, stands for bipyridine ligand. And if we react the 3 plus and 2 plus species, 3 plus and 1 plus species, I should say, they will form an excited state 2 plus rubipi. which uh, then can decay using by emission of light and will also form a ground state, rubipi. Now, by if, when we do this, we're not, I'm not necessarily talking about electrochemiluminescence. We're talking about just reacting the anth anion radicals, anion cation radicals. All of these species are not particularly stable. Uh, and so if we want to make diphenylanthracene radical cations, radical anions, they're pretty reactive with water and uh, with oxygen too. And so in order to make these chemically and mix them together is pretty difficult. But electrochemistry is actually pretty nice because we can just generate these directly at an electrode surface and we don't have to wait to mix them with something else. We can immediately make the counter reagent also electrochemically. So using electrochemistry, we can do both of the reactions at the same time that are being mixing together. And so the electrode generation can be an efficient and rapid way to do that. Also, you can get quantitative results out of this. We can quantitatively know what the reaction is because we can know, we can simulate the, the system. 
Um, just as an example, uh, if we take a molecule rubrine, which is another polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon which can fluoresce efficiently, but if you do the reduction of rubrine, you get a wave out at about minus 1.5 volts to form the rubrine radical anion, we'll call it R dot, R minus dot. We can also then get another wave, which is the ground state material being oxidized minus electron to the radical cation, and that occurs at about plus one volt. <clears throat> so getting these two together uh, will tend to produce light. Now, we can't do it with CV very efficiently because by the time we make R minus dot and scan all the way back, we notice we've already removed all those R minus dots with CV. Uh, so what we want to do is do a, a more rapid switching back and forth, and that usually involves a pulsing method where we would take the electrode and step it from, say, minus 1.5 volts or above minus 1.5 volts to below or greater than positive 1 volt. and back again, and we'd have um, times for those, maybe call them TF, tau F, and tau sub reverse. And what we would get out is initially we would see no light here because we, we're making the radical anion, but that's all that's present in the system. But as soon as we generate some of the radical anion, we can switch back uh, to make the radical cation. Now there are some radical anion and radical cation together at the same time, and now we get light output. And we would get light output as we step back to the other point again as well. Now TF and T, tau sub F and tau sub R don't have to be the same. They can uh, be different values, and sometimes people will do that to optimize the light production. Now. Why, how does that work? I mean, we're not, obviously, when we're doing the steps back and forth, if we, if we stepped out to make R minus dot, we're making that in solution. If we step back to plus one volt, obviously, we're going to oxidize that radical anion that's at the electrode surface to R plus dot. So not only R will be oxidized, but R plus R minus dot will be oxidized at that point. But some of the R minus dot will not be right at the electrode surface that will have diffused away. And so we can use the material that's diffused away from the electrode surface as our material to do the electrochemical generation of ECL. So at the first, at the point at which we're doing T is equal to tau sub F, what's going to happen is that we're going to have this kind of concentration profiles in solution. R and R minus dot. When we step so that tau is greater than tau sub F, and we're stepping now in the T sub R, tau sub R region, what's happened? Well, we're making R plus dot now efficiently, so it's going to be there, but it will have started to react with all the R minus dot that is now present outside the system. Uh, R minus dot is present out here. As soon as we make the R plus dot, all that reacts away, so we get a pretty fast and rapid concentration changes and the R that will be efficiently made now by the, by the combination of R minus dot and R plus dot in the system. And um, we'll have now R plus dot right at the electrode surface at a, at a, in an efficient way. So as long as we're making R plus dot, we're going to be using up some of the R minus dot in solution. So when those meet right at this point, R plus and minus dot are both present here. They're going to meet and react. And so right at that point, the concentration of R plus dot and R minus dot is zero. 
but as the reaction proceeds, the R plus dot will now diffuse out farther in solution, and so we'll, we'll sweep up some more of those R minus dots to do the light. And you see what happens though, that becomes less and less efficient as we go further on in time. So at that point, we want to make a sacrifice. We'll say, well, let's stop making light. Let's step back and make some more R minus dot. At that point, now there's going to be some R plus available to do the reaction uh, because it's now here in solution and, then, and, and, and vice versa. So we'll keep doing that reaction and so on. So the stepping back and forth will allow us to efficiently generate light. This works pretty good with big electrodes, but now that people have microelectrodes, you can do these stepping back and forth much faster so we can more efficiently generate these species at high time scales. And so in fact, uh, the faster you step, typically the more light you get out up to a certain point. And uh, people have done that. With, so with small electrodes, they can do a pretty good job. All right. Let's take another uh, idea here. Um, the other way to do it is do what they call steady state methods. Uh, and here we just, instead of stepping back and forth, we just use two separate electrodes. And each electrode then is in charge of doing uh, making R dot or R plus minus, depending on the system. And it actually works pretty well with flowing systems where we're flowing across two electrodes, or if we're using microelectrodes that are small and closely spaced, the diffusion itself will allow pretty, pretty efficient generation. So we can take R to R minus dot and R to R plus dot on the other electrode And of course, they can react to produce light. And so they'll produce light in between that little gap in between the two electrodes. In fact, you don't need to even need a, a potentiostat for this. All you need to do is just use a battery and an adjustable battery of some sort and adjust the voltage until you get light out. And uh, that works pretty good. What's the point of this? Well, light is nice, but we're not making light bulbs out of these things. There's no reason that you're going to ever get enough light to, to do anything important probably with these systems and sort of a, 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 to, for light. But the point is that you can look at the light spectra and tell what the, the materials that you've made are. But probably the most important reason people are doing it after the initial physical chemistry studies of it and the organic chemistry studies of it, there's implications for electron transfer rates and long range electron transfer and so on. But the important thing that they're going to be doing is using these sorts of experiments to do analytical chemistry. And the reason I want to do, use it for analytical chemistry is the reason that people are always interested in chemiluminescence as an as a instrumental method. Anytime you can generate light without having to put light into the system to begin with, for example, in fluorescence, you have to put light into the system to get light out of the system. Uh, and so that light coming in is going to act as a background which you want to remove. Um, but in this case, in the electrochemistry generation of the light, there's no light there to begin with, so the background is always very low. And so that generally translates into very good analytical situations. And so you can use very sensitive light detection equipment and to see very small amounts of light and get good analytical detection. One way in which that's been done is to do some biomedical, biomedical type detections. Uh, one of the things that's interesting about biomedicine is that they often use a lot of tagged reagents that are a lot of times tagged with radioactive compounds and they use that radioactivity because they get a very sensitive detection of radioactivity to do their analyses. Of course, that leads to some environmental problems. People are nervous about that, so they'd like to use some other way. And in fact, this electrochemistry labeled, or ECL labeled compounds is a way to generate signals without having to use radioactivity. 
There's a company called iGen who is just one of a couple of different ones. And what they do is they take uh, a molecule, a rubipi molecule, but they tag one of the, the bipyridine ligands with a carboxylate group. They don't tag it, they just modify it. So the, what they'll have there is that they've got a carboxylate group. And we talked about this biotin avidin coupling before, and they can take that carboxylate group and have it so that it can be attached to a surface. Or, or in particular, to a protein or a biological molecule. So what they can do is they can tag a biological species with this bipyridine ligand. So once we've got that tagged onto the surface, we can then add, make a rubipi out of the system. We can add the rubipi into the system, a ruthenium in the system, and make a complex that way. So you take rubipi and you use the system electrochemistry setup to oxidize it to 3 plus. Now rather than making the 1 plus rubipi, which doesn't really work, what you want to do is add in what they call tripropylamine. Well, that's not, they call it because that's what it is. A TPA. And if you oxidize it, it's not clear exactly what happens, but you can kind of imagine that what happens is that you form uh, this amine radical. And that amine radical reacting with the rubipi 3 plus gives us enough light energy to do the, um, to get, uh, gives, gives us enough energy to do the light output. And so what you can do is you can oxidize both the rubipi and the TPA on one electrode and get light out of the system. And so that means it's a very simple electrochemical system. You don't have to change the voltage or anything like that. How do we detect something? Well, the detection will be based on our tagged rubipi that's coming in. Remember, we've got a tagged material coming in, and as long as there's no protein that's got the rubipi on there, there's going to be no light output. But as soon as rubipi comes in that's tagged onto our protein, the light will now be proportional to the protein or whatever that has the, this bipi tag on it. Another way to do that is instead of tripropylamine is to use oxalate. And what happens when you reduce or oxidize oxalate is you form this oxalate radical anion, which is very unstable, that decomposes to carbon dioxide and a carbon dioxide radical anion, which is a very strong reductant. So that CO2 minus dot is formed by an oxidation. So we make a something that's very reduced by oxidizing the oxalate anion. And so that CO2 minus again reacts with the rubipi 3 plus, forms enough energy to get light output and um, you know we'll write it in a abbreviated form. So the question is what to use and you can use uh, different sorts of things, but you'll all get the ruthenium 2 plus excited state which emits light and goes through it. So you can tag that with antibodies uh, and so on. You can use lots of different ways to do it. One of the ways that people have done it is to um, tag, um, tag little beads that are iron oxide beads that have a coating on it and you put the reagent on the, the iron oxide beads which are attracted, you stir that up in your solution and um, you use a magnet to collect all those little beads out of the solution and then you can do the electrochemistry of the system of the, the stuff on the beads itself and then you get light off of those little beads and so that allows you to do sort of a bulk process and then collect them all and see the light that's coming out. Okay, 
Well, we're out of time on our tape, so let's stop here for just a few minutes and we'll uh, 